So um, I'm going to keep my remarks brief. That um, you know there are um, you know only six or eight hundred children a year who die of leukemia in the U.S. because we have advanced medical therapies, but it's ten thousand a year in India. So I think we have a medical emergency on how we can install that. I got a text from Emma Whitehead's father uh, two weeks ago. She just had her 14th birthday. And so, and so I've been working with a graduate student in my lab, Sonia Agarwal, and now um, Rahul Puar in Mumbai on how to install indigenous CAR T cell therapies in India. And I think that's what I want to focus on. I mean, there's the whole larger issue, which is cell and gene therapy and how do we disrupt therapies in the U.S. to bring those out. And that's a, a huge issue. Uh, in India, it's a different one. Um, and um, so you heard about Emma's. Uh, my disclosures are Novartis and uh, Timunity. There are uh, articles written on exactly the issues of the CAR T cells. But we now have this issue that in the U.S. it's very different than India. Um, and um, how do we change this issue in, into emerging economies? Um, so we have this very large, you know, it was talked about by Andy about, you know, cancer immunotherapy and its growth. Um, but CAR T cell therapy research is primarily in U.S. and China. There are no trials in India. Um, and you can see the summer, southern hemisphere is really devoid of this. So. There's lots of research. Uh, there were three trials in 2010, and was treated in 2012, and now there's over 400 trials. Um, but how do we make this? It's an emerging, you know, industry and you know, new way of delivering therapy. How can we, you know, change the scale of the time of how it comes out? And the, um, so one aspect that's different. There's a, a, a paper written by Beth Schachter, shown here who discuss, discusses this, and that the most rapid way to have it happen would be a government-private philanthropic partnership. So it's different than a drug that's made, you know, in a single manufacturing you know, center and then distributed. These are patient-specific cells. They're from a regulatory point of view. They're N of 1. And it's most closely related to a bone marrow transplant. You know, but the bone marrow transplant was never regulated by the FDA. It emerged, and now we have it. And I think we need to look at CAR-T as that way. It's very hard to have a therapy like that. It's not just reimbursed as a price of the cell therapy, but it's an entire system. And uh, so we need to, to figure this out. The solution's probably different in the U.S. than it is in India. Um, and this is from a friend of mine, Chris Roy, who's at Georgia Tech, who is looking at this from an engineer's perspective of all the things that have to happen when you have a new therapy. And we need... All kind of, there's a whole e ecosystem that needs to be established, and that's happening now rapidly. Um, I heard from Marcella Mouse today that there's 60 biotechs just in the Boston, uh, Cambridge area now. It's unbelievable. There's over 500 cell therapy companies, and when I started this, there were zero, and then Novartis came in, and now we've had more than $30 billion investment in the U.S., but none of it's happening in India. Um, and so these are some considerations that I think we can discuss. Um, you know, how do we do this? There's the issue of cell therapy here, but there's the whole cell and gene therapy, and how do we do this in, you know, developed economies compared to non-developed? Um, in India, from what I've talked with my friends, there are no guidelines. So who's going to invest when you have no way to know? Can you bring something to market? Um, and then the infrastructure. Currently, to do a CAR T cell therapy, you need a massive infrastructure. Half of our patients with advanced disease end up in an ICU. Next generation CAR T cells won't do that, and that's only a few years away. It will be an outpatient therapy. So it could be a one and done therapy without the massive infrastructure that we have currently on, the, on generation 1.0. Um, so, so that's limiting the, in India, but soon there will be you know, CAR T cells that are non-toxic, and, and um, so then it becomes cost of goods, and can we implement it? Um, so, you know, in our case, philanthropic support was absolutely essential to do this, um, and then pharma and biotech have come in, and I think that we need that in, in uh, industry and in India. 
in India, from what I understand, I mean, there is a reluctance to invest in early stage technologies. It's been directed at late stage. So we need some risk taking and a, and a pathway to bring this into uh, India. Um, and, and, you know, we talk about the cost of goods. So Novartis right now makes less money selling CAR T cells than they do other drugs. Later, the cost of goods will come down. And in India, it could be much cheaper. We don't need to reproduce what we do in the U.S. where we have an N of one. So there's no issues like there is with a large vaccine where you can have class action lawsuits. These are one patient products, so the worst that can happen is one patient. So the standards for an N of one need to be different than they are for something that could be a vaccine for a million children. And right now the standards are the same. And so, so we need risk taking and what's appropriate in India is different than it is uh, in the US um, and Europe. Um, so, so I'm hoping that the India will develop guidelines to take this in into consideration and then this could, um, you know, there, there could be a pathway rapidly to, to have next generation cars and develop uh, there because uh, um, it actually could work better with the infrastructure um, it, you know, by, uh, by having a one and done therapy. So I'll stop with that. And um, Roger. Wonderful. So I think as all of you know that, uh, you know, Carl has been a pioneer uh, in thinking about these approaches. Uh, for hematologic malignancies, and he has shown uh, how these are not partial responses, uh, but actually cures uh, for patients. And we've been thinking about these approaches now for a variety of different types of uh, cancers. And uh, he has uh, provided a vision now uh, for how we might be able to make it affordable for uh, a lot of uh, people. And uh, so let's open uh, the floor for, for discussion. I don't think I need one. <laughs> how, how has China been able to move so fast into this field? Is it because of, of capital investment on the part of the government? Is it a change in regulation? Uh, is it uh, the, the biophysical, biochemical expertise that was there before, um, before uh, the therapy was developed? Yes, yeah, so I, I think what I've learned is the emergence of cell and gene therapy is very different geographically. So there's huge geographic disparity. You know, in China, they're willing to take risk. There's much less risk taking in Europe, for instance, as you know. And um, China also, I, I mentioned that article and, and the idea that if we, with cell and gene therapy, you need a government, private, you know, and uh, philanthropic partnership. China invested from a central, you know, government they said this is a high priority. So they put part of their GDP into cell and gene therapy and that's how they've overtaken us. They had no innovation there. And so they invest a higher part. I mean, their budget is much larger in this, not their entire biomedical research enterprise, but it is in cell and gene therapy. They decided they wanted to be a leader there. And so, I mean, there, there's an issue of IP and, and all that you know, that, that we have right now with say fifth generation you know, uh, technologies of the internet and, and, and they want to win there too. So they um, have been able in certain areas in China, there's just recent new guidelines that came out about a month ago from China. They're only in Mandarin right now, but there was a review written about this and uh, they, they have decided now that leading hospitals in China can charge and get reimbursed for new cell and gene therapies without FDA approval, their equivalent of the, in, in China. So they have a different regulatory strategy in China for cell and gene therapy than we do in the US. And, and you know, we need to come to some, I mean, the FDA has been a leader in this and has been really quite amazing and is very accommodating um, in, on this. And the Chinese are trying to leapfrog, leapfrog us. 
Thank you, Cole, for the excellent presentation on court sales. Uh, just I want to, uh, this is not a question, this is just a comment from the Indian side. The Government of India, Ministry of Health, uh, have already constituted the export committee to frame guidance document on uh, gene therapy and uh, related new technologies. And probably in the next couple of uh, months, we are able to come up with the new guidelines for the court sales. And some of the Indian companies, they're already doing a lot of innovation uh, in the court sales. You may be knowing one of your sponsor of this uh, program is they're also involved in developing the court sales in India. And we have very well established the patent regime, the sales which are developed in India. We have Indian Patent Act under which their rights have been well protected under the act. Uh, recently, we also almost finalized the regulations and uh, guidance document on regenerative medicine. The stem cell therapy guidelines have already been published, uh, which are, we have received a lot of comments on that. We are in the stages of finalization of these draft guidelines. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions, comments? I mean, that's great to hear. We've, we've heard, you know, how in other technologies like for instance, in Africa, they're basically leapfrogging. They went straight to cell phones without landlines. I think in India, with those, that kind of leadership, you could do the same. Carl, um, again, congratulations. Um, I don't know what it might feel like to be able to help even one patient like Emma, but to help future patients. It's, it's quite incredible. So congratulations again. Uh, you already have, uh, have thoughts about how uh, these therapies can uh, affect other cancers other than uh, leukemias. Uh, but what are your thoughts about even beyond that? And we mentioned this morning about uh, the possibility of affecting autoimmune diseases and beyond. So may maybe if you just opine about that for a second, we'd all appreciate it. So thanks, Bill. There's, um, I mean, we have this emerging scientific overwhelming data that the immune system and inflammation contribute to many diseases from you know neurodegenerative to atherosclerosis and and so I think the immune system could be brought to bear on that um, and uh, there are already data that for instance in, in mouse models that regulatory T cells which can turn off the immune system can in mice treat you know, EAE, which is equivalent to multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes. Um, we have CAR T cells now that we're trying to treat mouse atherosclerosis, you know, targeting oxidized LDL. So I think there's many approaches that, that will happen with engineered cells, and it won't be just T cells. It'll be NK cells, bone marrow stem cells, uh, for instance, um, and all kinds of iPSCs. So there will be a cell therapy industry, I think, that's, you know, will target inflammation at, at different, you know, depends on the disease and hopefully to get into people at risk for cancer. I mean, we heard, you know, 10% of patients have familial cancers, probably more than that. Preventing that, you know, instead of, for instance, ovarian cancer where it's surgical castration, could we install a cell therapy system so that the patient never gets o ovarian cancer? I think all that will happen. In, in some time scale that we don't know at this point, but the science is there. Can I ask one more so, question? So, Carl, uh, a question? Many people think that, uh, you know, these types of uh, therapies are very expensive, and uh, we, were, we were talking earlier, and uh, you were making a case that this is not more expensive than the chemotherapy, and certainly less expensive than uh, transplants. Can you talk about that a little bit more? I mean, I think the, the, there's two relevant analogies. Uh, we're at the beginning of a new industry. You know, um, initially computers were room size and very expensive and it came down a million fold in expense. I think that will happen. So that this will be literally, uh, you know, the cells will be manufactured in a machine. Right now the most expensive part of the cost of goods is uh, human labor. So if it were automated, then it becomes uh, cheap and much cheaper than we already have. So I think that's going to happen. The, the question is the time scale of how long that takes to happen. Um, but uh, then the cost of goods barrier goes away. Yeah. We got a yeah, question, question here. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Jim, for this. Can you just comment on the balance that we have with innovation 
and competition. I mean, when you look at the CD19 space, I mean, how many companies, how many CD19 approaches do we really need? And are, are we really spending our capital, you know, really to, to really address the harder problems, or are we sort of tripping over each other? I mean, uh, that's a whole huge issue on, you know, the development. There will be many next generation therapies uh, that are both more effective and less toxic. And then there's going to be less, um, you know, the cost of goods and so on. So I hopefully market competition will work to bring down the cost. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have a lot, you know, that hasn't happened with other cancer immunotherapies. So this is an issue with pricing in general in the U.S., and that's a whole other discussion. But the technology is there, and hopefully uh, VC investments will bring out better therapies. But pricing is a larger discussion that you all know is very complicated. Paul, thank you so much.